We hope you will enjoy this famous audiobook, The Poirot, and the value and effort that we bring you these audiobooks of world famous author Agatha Christie. If so, then why not buy us a cup of coffee? Look for the link in the description below. Make sure you subscribe to this channel so that you will not miss another video. Thank you for supporting this channel. It is appreciated. The Veiled Lady I had noticed that for some time Poirot had been growing increasingly dissatisfied and restless. We had had no interesting cases of late, nothing on which my little friend could exercise his keen wits and remarkable powers of deduction. This morning he flung down the newspaper with an impatient cha, a favourite exclamation of his which sounded exactly like a cat sneezing. They fear me, Hastings. The criminals of your England, they fear me. When the cat is there, the little mice, they come no more to the cheese. Well, I don't suppose the greater part of them even know of your existence, I said, laughing. Poirot looked at me reproachfully. He always imagines that the whole world is thinking and talking of Hercule Poirot. He had certainly made a name for himself in London, but I could hardly believe that his existence struck terror into the criminal world. What about that daylight robbery of jewels in Bond Street the other day? I asked. A neat coup, said Poirot approvingly, though not in my line. Pas de finesse, seulement de l'audace. A man with a loaded cane smashes the plate glass window of a jeweler's shop and grabs a number of precious stones. Worthy citizens immediately seize him, a policeman arrives, he is caught red-handed with the jewels on him, he is marched off to the police station, and then it is discovered that the stones are paste. He has passed the real ones to a confederate, one of the aforementioned worthy citizens. He will go to prison, true, but when he comes out, there will be a nice little fortune awaiting him. Yes, not badly imagined. But I could do better than that. Sometimes, Hastings, I regret that I am of such a moral disposition. To work against the law, it would be pleasing for a change. Oh, cheer up, Poirot. You know you are unique in your own line. But what is there on hand in my own line? I picked up the paper. Oh, well, here's an Englishman mysteriously done to death in Holland, I said. Oh, they always say that. And later they find that he ate the tinned fish and that his death is perfectly natural. Well, if you're determined to grouse... Tiens, said Poirot, who had strolled across to the window. Or oh, here, in the street, is what they call in novels a heavily veiled lady. She mounts the steps. She rings the bell. She comes to consult us. Here is a possibility of something interesting. When one is as young and pretty as that one, one does not veil the face except for a big affair. A minute later, our visitor was ushered in. As Poirot had said, she was indeed heavily veiled. It was impossible to distinguish her features until she raised her veil of black Spanish lace. Then I saw that Poirot's intuition had been right. The lady was extremely pretty, with fair hair and blue eyes. From the costly simplicity of her attire, I deduced at once that she belonged to the upper strata of society. Monsieur Poirot, said the lady in a soft, musical voice, I am in great trouble. I can hardly believe that you can help me, but I have heard such wonderful things of you that I come literally as the last hope to beg you to do the impossible. Ah, the impossible! It pleases me always, said Poirot. Continue, I beg of you, mademoiselle. Our fair guest hesitated. Ah, but you must be frank, added Poirot. You must not leave me in the dark on any point. I will trust you, the girl said suddenly. You have heard of Lady Millicent Castle Vaughan? I looked up with keen interest. The announcement of Lady Millicent's engagement to the young Duke of Southshire had appeared a few days previously. She was, I knew, the fifth daughter of an impecunious Irish peer, and the Duke of Southshire was one of the best matches in England. I am Lady Millicent, continued the girl. You may have read of my engagement. I should be one of the happiest girls alive, but... Oh, Monsieur Poirot, I'm in terrible trouble. There is a man, a horrible man. His name is Lavington, and he... I hardly know how to tell you. There was a letter I wrote. I was only sixteen at the time, and he... he... A letter that you wrote to this Mr. Lavington? Oh, no, not to him. 
to a young soldier. I was very fond of him. He was killed in the war. I understand, said Poirot kindly. It was a foolish letter, an indiscreet letter, but indeed, Monsieur Poirot, nothing more. There are phrases in it which, which might bear a different interpretation. I see, said Poirot. And this letter has come into the possession of Mr. Lavington. Yes, and he threatens, unless I pay him an enormous sum of money, a sum that is quite impossible for me to raise, to send it to the Duke. The dirty swine! I ejaculated. I beg your pardon, Lady Millicent. Would it not be wiser to confess all to your future husband? I dare not, Monsieur Poirot. The Duke is a rather peculiar character, jealous and suspicious and prone to believe the worst. I might as well break off my engagement at once. Dear, dear, said Poirot, with an expressive grimace. And what do you want me to do, milady? Well, I thought perhaps that I might ask Mr. Lavington to call upon you. I would tell him that you were empowered by me to discuss the matter. Perhaps you could reduce his demands. What sum does he mention? Twenty thousand pounds. An impossibility. I doubt if I could raise a thousand even. You might perhaps borrow the money on the prospect of your approaching marriage. But I doubt if you could get hold of half that sum. Besides, eh bien, it is repugnant to me that you should pay. No. The ingenuity of Hercule Poirot shall defeat your enemies. Send me this, Mr. Lavington. Is he likely to bring the letter with him? The girl shook her head. I do not think so. He's very cautious. I suppose there is no doubt that he really has it. Well, he showed it to me when I went to his house. You went to his house? Well, that was very imprudent, milady. Was it? I was so desperate. I hoped my entreaties might move him. Oh, la la! The Lavingtons of this world are not moved by entreaties. He would welcome them as showing how much importance you attach to the documents. Where does he live, this fine gentleman? At Buena Vista, Wimbledon. I went there after dark, Poirot groaned. I declared that I would inform the police in the end, but he only laughed in a horrid, sneering manner. By all means, my dear Lady Millicent, do so if you wish, he said. Yes, it is hardly an affair for the police, murmured Poirot. But I think you'll be wiser than that, he continued. See, here is your letter, in this little Chinese puzzle box. He held it so that I could see it. I tried to snatch at it, but he was too quick for me. With a horrid smile, he folded it up and replaced it in the little wooden box. It'll be quite safe here, I assure you, he said. And the box itself lives in such a clever place that you will never find it. My eyes turned to the small wall safe, and he shook his head and laughed. I have a better safe than that, he said. Oh, he was so odious, Monsieur Poirot. Do you think that you can help me? Have faith in Papa Poirot. I will find a way. These reassurances were all very well, I thought, as Poirot gallantly ushered his fair client down the stairs. But it seemed to me that we had a tough nut to crack. I said as much to Poirot when he returned. He nodded ruefully. Yes, the solution does not leap to the eye. He has the whip hand, this Monsieur Lavington. For the moment, I do not see how we are to circumvent him. Mr. Lavington duly called upon us that afternoon. Lady Millicent had spoken truly when she described him as an odious man. I felt a positive tingling in the end of my boot, so keen was I to kick him down the stairs. He was blustering and overbearing in manner, laughed Poirot's gentle suggestions to scorn, and generally showed himself as a master of the situation. I could not help feeling that Poirot was hardly appearing at his best. He looked discouraged and crestfallen. "'Well, gentlemen,' said Lavington, as he took up his hat. We don't seem to be getting much further. The case stands like this. I'll let the Lady Millicent off cheap, as she is such a charming young lady. He leered odiously. We'll say eighteen thousand. I'm off to Paris today. Little piece of business to attend to over there. I shall be back on Tuesday. Unless the money is paid by Tuesday evening, the letter goes to the Duke. Don't tell me Lady Millicent can't raise the money— some of her gentlemen friends would be only too willing to oblige such a pretty young woman with a loan. If she goes the right way about it. My face flushed, and I took a step forward. 
but Lavington had wheeled out of the room as he finished his sentence. My God, I cried. Something's got to be done. You seem to be taking this lying down, Poirot. You have an excellent heart, my friend, but your grey cells are in a deplorable condition. I have no wish to impress Mr. Lavington with my capabilities. The more pusillanimous he thinks me, the better. Why? It is curious, murmured Poirot reminiscently, that I should have uttered a wish to work against the law just before Lady Millicent arrived. You're going to burgle his house while he's away, I gasped. Sometimes, Hastings, your mental processes are amazingly quick. Well, suppose he takes the letter with him? Poirot shook his head. That is very unlikely. He has evidently a hiding place in his house that he fancies to be pretty impregnable. Oh, when do we, uh, do the deed? Tomorrow night. We will start from here about eleven o'clock. At the appointed time, I was ready to set off. I had donned a dark suit and a soft dark hat. Poirot beamed kindly on me. You have dressed the part, I see, he observed. Come, let us take the underground to Wimbledon. Or are we going to take anything with us? Tools to break in with? My dear Hastings, Hercule Poirot does not adopt such crude methods. I retired, snubbed, but my curiosity was alert. It was just on midnight that we entered the small suburban garden of Buena Vista. The house was dark and silent. Poirot went straight to a window at the back of the house, raised the sash noiselessly, and bade me enter. How did you know this window would be open? I whispered, for it really seemed uncanny. Because I soared through the catch this morning. What? But yes, it was most simple. I called, presented a fictitious card, and one of Inspector Japp's official ones. I said I had been sent, recommended by Scotland Yard, to attend to some burglar-proof fastenings that Monsieur Lavington wanted fixed while he was away. The housekeeper welcomed me with enthusiasm. It seems they have had two attempted burglaries here lately. Evidently our little idea has occurred to other clients of Mr. Lavington's. With nothing of value taken, I examined all the windows, made my little arrangement, forbade the servants to touch the windows until tomorrow, as they were electrically connected up, and withdrew gracefully. <laughs> really, Poirot, you're wonderful. Mon ami, it was of the simplest. Now, to work. The servants sleep at the top of the house, so we will run little risk of disturbing them. I presume the safe is built into the wall somewhere. Safe? Fiddlesticks. There is no safe. Mr. Lavington is an intelligent man. You will see. He will have devised a hiding place much more intelligent than a safe. A safe is the first thing everyone looks for. Whereupon we began a systematic search of the entire place. But after several hours ransacking of the house, our search had been unavailing. I saw symptoms of anger gathering on Poirot's face. Ah! Sapristi! Is Hercule Poirot to be beaten? Never. Let us be calm. Let us reflect. Let us reason. Let us, enfin, employ our little grey cells. He paused for some moments, bending his brows in concentration. Then the green light I knew so well stole into his eyes. I have been an imbecile. The kitchen. The kitchen, I cried. But that's impossible. The servants, exactly. Just what ninety-nine people out of a hundred would say. And for that very reason, the kitchen is the ideal place to choose. It is full of various homely objects, en avant, to the kitchen. I followed him, completely sceptical, and watched whilst he dived into bread bins, tapped saucepans, put his head into the gas oven. In the end, tired of watching him, I strolled back to the study. I was convinced that there, and only there, would we find the cash. I made a further minute search, noted that it was now a quarter past four, and that therefore it would soon be growing light, and then went back to the kitchen regions. To my utter amazement, Poirot was now standing right inside the coal bin, to the utter ruin of his neat light suit. He made a grimace. But yes, my friend, it is against all my instincts to so ruin my appearance, but what will you? But Lavington couldn't have buried it under the coal. If you would use your eyes, you would see that it is not the coal that I examine. 
I then saw, on a shelf behind the coal bunker, some logs of wood were piled. Poirot was dexterously taking them down one by one. Suddenly he uttered a low exclamation, Your knife, Hastings! I handed it to him. He appeared to insert it in the wood, and suddenly the log split in two. It had been neatly sawn in half, and a cavity hollowed out in the center. From this cavity, Poirot took a little wooden box of Chinese make. Well done, I cried, carried out of myself. Gently, Hastings, do not raise your voice too much. Come, let us be off before the daylight is upon us. Slipping the box into his pocket, he leapt lightly out of the coal bunker, brushed himself down as well as he could, and leaving the house by the same way as we had come, we walked rapidly in the direction of London. But what an extraordinary place, I expostulated. Anyone might have used the log. In July, Hastings? And it was at the bottom of the pile, a very ingenious hiding place. Ah, here is a taxi. Now for home, a wash, and a refreshing sleep. After the excitement of the night, I slept late. When I finally strolled into our sitting room just before one o'clock, I was surprised to see Poirot leaning back in an armchair, the Chinese box open beside him, calmly reading the letter he had taken from it. He smiled at me affectionately and tapped the sheet he held. She was right, the Lady Millicent. Never would the Duke have pardoned this letter. It contains some of the most extravagant terms of affection I have ever come across. Oh, really, Poirot, I said rather disgustedly. I don't think you should have read the letter. That sort of thing just isn't done. It is done by Hercule Poirot, replied my friend imperturbably. And another thing, I said. I don't think using Jap's official card yesterday was quite playing the game. But I was not playing a game, Hastings. I was conducting a case. I shrugged my shoulders. One can't argue with a point of view. A step on the stairs, said Poirot. That will be Lady Millicent. Our fair client came in with an anxious expression on her face, which changed to one of delight on seeing the letter and box which Poirot held up. Oh, Monsieur Poirot, how wonderful of you! How did you do it? By rather reprehensible methods, milady. But Mr. Lavington will not prosecute. Uh, this is your letter, is it not? She glanced through it. Yes. Oh, how can I ever thank you? You are a wonderful, wonderful man. Where was it hidden? Poirot told her, How very clever of you! She took up the small box from the table. I shall keep this as a souvenir. I had hoped, my lady, that you would permit me to keep it, also as a souvenir. I hope to send you a better souvenir than that on my wedding day. You shall not find me ungrateful, Monsieur Poirot. The pleasure of doing you a service will be more to me than a check. So you permit that I retain the box. Oh, no, Monsieur Poirot, I simply must have that, she cried laughingly. She stretched out her hand, but Poirot was before her, his hand closed over it. I think not. His voice had changed. What do you mean? Her voice seemed to have grown sharper. At any rate, permit me to abstract its further contents. You observed that the original cavity has been reduced by half. In the top half, the compromising letter. In the bottom, he made a nimble gesture, then held out his hand. On the palm were four large, glittering stones, and two big, milky-white pearls. The jewels stolen in Bond Street the other day, I rather fancy, murmured Poirot. Jap will tell us. To my utter amazement, Jap himself stepped out from Poirot's bedroom. An old friend of yours, I believe, said Poirot politely to Lady Millicent. Nabbed. By the Lord, said Lady Millicent, with a complete change of manner. You nippy old devil! She looked at Poirot with almost affectionate awe. Well, Gertie, my dear, said Jap, the game's up this time, I fancy. Fancy seeing you again so soon. We've got your pal, too, the gentleman who called here the other day, calling himself Lavington. As for Lavington himself, alias Croker, alias Reed, I wonder which of the gang it was who stuck a knife into him the other day in Holland. Thought he'd got the goods with him, didn't you? And he hadn't. He double-crossed you properly. Hit him in his own house. You had two fellows looking for them, and then you tackled Monsieur Poirot here, and by a piece of amazing luck, he found them. You do like talking, don't you? said the late Lady Millicent. 
Easy there now. I'll go quietly. You can't say that I'm not the perfect lady. Ta da all. The shoes were wrong, said Poirot dreamily, while I was still too stupefied to speak. I have made my little observations of your English nation, and a lady, a born lady, is always particular about her shoes. She may have shabby clothes, but she will be well shod. Now, this lady Millicent had smart, expensive clothes and cheap shoes. It was not likely that either you or I should have seen the real Lady Millicent. She has been very little in London, and this girl had a certain superficial resemblance which would pass well enough. As I say, the shoes first awakened my suspicions, and then her story and her veil were a little melodramatic, eh? The Chinese box with a bogus compromising letter in the top must have been known to all the gang, but the log of wood was the late Mr. Lavington's idea. Eh, par exemple, Hastings, I hope you will not again wound my feelings as you did yesterday by saying that I am unknown to the criminal classes. Ma foi! They even employ me when they themselves fail. The Plymouth Express Alex Simpson, R.N., stepped from the platform at Newton Abbott into a first-class compartment of the Plymouth Express. A porter followed him with a heavy suitcase. He was about to swing it up to the rack, but the young sailor stopped him. Uh, no, uh, leave it on the seat. I'll put it up later. Oh, uh, here you are. Oh, thank you, sir. The porter generously tipped, withdrew. Doors banged. A stentorian voice shouted, Plymouth only! Change for Torquay! Plymouth next stop! Then a whistle blew, and the train drew slowly out of the station. Lieutenant Simpson had the carriage to himself. The December air was chilly, and he pulled up the window. Then he sniffed vaguely and frowned. What a smell there was! Reminded him of that time in hospital and the operation on his leg. Oh, yes, chloroform. That was it. He let the window down again, changing his seat to one with its back to the engine. He pulled a pipe out of his pocket and lit it. For a little time he sat inactive, looking out into the night and smoking. At last he roused himself, and opening the suitcase, took out some papers and magazines, then closed the suitcase again and endeavoured to shove it under the opposite seat, without success. Some obstacle resisted it. He shoved harder with rising impatience, but it still stuck out halfway into the carriage. Why the devil won't it go in? he muttered, and hauling it out completely, he stooped down and peered under the seat. A moment later, a cry rang out into the night, and the great train came to an unwilling halt in obedience to the imperative jerking of the communication cord. Mon ami, said Poirot, you have, I know, been deeply interested in this mystery of the Plymouth Express. Read this. I picked up the note he flicked across the table to me. It was brief and to the point. Dear sir, I shall be obliged if you will call upon me at your earliest convenience, yours faithfully, Ebenezer Halliday. The connection was not clear to my mind, and I looked inquiringly at Poirot. For an answer, he took up the newspaper and read aloud, a sensational discovery was made last night. A young naval officer returning to Plymouth found under the seat of his compartment the body of a woman stabbed through the heart. The officer at once pulled a communication cord and the train was brought to a standstill. The woman, who was about thirty years of age and richly dressed, has not yet been identified. And later we have this. Ah. The woman found dead in the Plymouth Express has been identified as the Honourable Mrs. Rupert Carrington. Hmm. You see now, my friend? Or if you do not, I will add this. Mrs. Rupert Carrington was, before her marriage, Flossie Halliday, daughter of old man Halliday, the steel king of America. Well, and he'll send for you. Splendid! I did him a little service in the past, an affair of bearer bonds, and once when I was in Paris for a royal visit I had Mademoiselle Flossie pointed out to me, <laughs> la jolie petite pensionnaire. She had the jolie dot, too. It caused trouble. She nearly made a bad affair. Oh, how was that? 
a certain Count de la Rochefort, un bien mauvais sujet, a bad hat, as you would say, an adventurer pure and simple who knew how to appeal to a romantic young girl. Luckily, her father got wind of it in time. He took her back to America in haste. I heard of her marriage some years later, but I know nothing of her husband. Hmm, I said. The Honourable Rupert Carrington is no beauty by all accounts. He had pretty well run through his own money on the turf, and I should imagine old man Halliday's dollars came along in the nick of time. I should say that for a good-looking, well-mannered, utterly unscrupulous young scoundrel, it would be hard to find his mate. Ah, the poor little lady. Elle n'est pas bien tombée. I fancy he made it pretty obvious at once that it was her money and not she that attracted him. I believe they drifted apart almost at once. I have heard rumours lately that there was to be a definite legal separation. Well, old man Halliday is no fool. He would tie up her money pretty tight. As I dare say. Anyway, I know the fact that the Honourable Rupert is said to be extremely hard up. Uh huh. I wonder. Oh, you wonder what? My good friend, do not jump down my throat like that. You are interested, I see. Suppose you accompany me to see Mr. Halliday. There is a taxi stand at the corner. A few minutes sufficed to whirl us to the superb house in Park Lane rented by the American Magnet. We were shown into the library, and almost immediately we were joined by a large, stout man with piercing eyes and an aggressive chin. Monsieur Poirot, said Mr. Halliday. I guess I don't need to tell you what I want you for. You've read the papers, and I'm never one to let the grass grow under my feet. I happened to hear you were in London, and I remembered the good work you did over those bonds. I never forget a name. I have got the pick of Scotland Yard, but I'll have my own man as well. Money, no object. All the dollars were made for my little girl, and now she's gone. I'll spend my last cent to catch the damn scoundrel that did it. See? So it's up to you to deliver the goods. Poirot bowed. I accept, monsieur, or the more willingly that I saw your daughter in Paris several times. And now I will ask you to tell me the circumstances of her journey to Plymouth and any other details that seem to you to bear upon the case. Well, to begin with, responded Halliday, she wasn't going to Plymouth. She was going to join a house party at Avonmead Court, the Duchess of Swansea's place. She left London by the 12.14 from Paddington, arriving at Bristol, where she had to change, at 2.50. The principal Plymouth Expresses, of course, run via Westbury and do not go near Bristol at all. The 12.14 does a non-stop run to Bristol, afterwards stopping at Weston, Taunton, Exeter, and Newton Abbott. My daughter travelled alone in her carriage, which was reserved as far as Bristol, her maid being in a third-class carriage in the next coach. Poirot nodded, and Mr. Halliday went on. The party at Avonmead Court was to be a very gay one, with several balls, and in consequence my daughter had with her nearly all her jewels, amounting in value perhaps to about a hundred thousand dollars. Oh, Momo, interrupted Poirot, who had charge of the jewels, your daughter or the maid? My daughter always took charge of them herself, carrying them in a small blue Morocco case. Continue, monsieur. At Bristol, the maid, Jane Mason, collected her mistress's dressing bag and wraps, which were with her, and came to the door of Flossie's compartment. To her intense surprise, my daughter told her that she was not getting out of Bristol, but was going on farther. She directed Mason to get out the luggage and put it in the cloakroom. She could have tea in the refreshment room, but she was to wait at the station for her mistress, who would return to Bristol by an uptrain in the course of the afternoon. The maid, although very much astonished, did as she was told. She put the luggage in the cloakroom and had some tea. But up train after up train came in, and her mistress did not appear. After the arrival of the last train, she left the luggage where it was and went to a hotel near the station for the night. This morning she read of the tragedy and returned to town by the first available train. Is there nothing to account for your daughter's sudden change of plan? Well, there is this. According to Jane Mason at Bristol, Flossie was no longer alone in her carriage. There was a man in it who stood looking out of the farther window so that she could not see his face. The train was a corridor one, of course? Yes. Which side was the corridor? On the platform side. My daughter was standing in the corridor as she talked to Mason. 
and there is no doubt in your mind. Oh, excuse me. He got up and carefully straightened the inkstand, which was a little askew. Je vous demande pardon, he continued, reseating himself. It affects my nerves to see anything crooked. Strange, is it not? As I was saying, monsieur, there is no doubt in your mind as to this probably unexpected meeting because the cause of your daughter's sudden change of plan? Well, it seems the only reasonable supposition. And you have no idea as to who the gentleman in question might be? The millionaire hesitated for a moment and then replied, No, I do not know at all. Now, as to the discovery of the body... Well, it was discovered by a young naval officer who at once gave the alarm. There was a doctor on the train. He examined the body. She had been first chloroformed and then stabbed. He gave it as his opinion that she had been dead about four hours, so it must have been done not long after leaving Bristol, probably between there and Weston, possibly between Weston and Taunton. And the jewel case? The jewel case, Monsieur Poirot, was missing... One thing more, monsieur. Your daughter's fortune, to whom does it pass at her death? Well, Flossie made a will soon after her marriage, leaving everything to her husband. He hesitated for a minute and then went on. Well, I may as well tell you, monsieur Poirot, that I regard my son-in-law as an unprincipled scoundrel and that by my advice my daughter was on the eve of freeing herself from him by legal means. No difficult matter. I settled her money upon her in such a way that he could not touch it during her lifetime, but although they have lived entirely apart for some years, she had frequently acceded to his demands for money rather than face an open scandal. However, I was determined to put an end to this. At last, Flossie agreed, and my lawyers were instructed to take proceedings. And where is Monsieur Carrington? In town. I believe he was away in the country yesterday, but he returned last night. Poirot considered a little while. Then he said, I think that is all, monsieur. You would like to see the maid, Jane Mason? If you please. Halliday rang the bell and gave a short order to the footman. A few minutes later, Jane Mason entered the room. A respectable, hard-featured woman, as emotionless in the face of tragedy as only a good servant can be. You will permit me to put a few questions? Your mistress, she was quite as usual before starting yesterday morning, not excited or flurried? Oh, no, sir. But at Bristol, she was quite different? Uh, yes, sir, regular upset. So nervous she didn't seem to know what she was saying. What did she say exactly? Well, sir, as near as I can remember, she said, Mason, I've got to alter my plans. Something has happened. I mean, I'm not getting out here after all. I must go on. Uh, get the luggage and put it in the cloakroom, then have some tea and wait for me in the station. Wait for you here, ma'am? I asked. Yes, yes. Don't leave the station. I shall return by a later train. I don't know when it mayn't be until quite late. Very well, ma'am, I says. Well, it wasn't my place to ask questions, but I thought it very strange. It was unlike your mistress, eh? Very unlike her, sir. What did you think? Well, sir, I thought it was to do with the gentleman in the carriage. She didn't speak to him, but she turned round once or twice as though to ask him if she was doing right. But you did not see the gentleman's face? No, sir. He stood with his back to me all the time. Can you describe him at all? He had on a light fawn overcoat and a travelling cap. He was tall and slender-like, and the back of his head was dark. You didn't know him? Oh, no, I don't think so, sir. It was not your master, Mr. Carrington, by any chance? Mason looked rather startled. Oh, I don't think so, sir. But you are not sure? It was about the master's build, sir, but I never thought of it being him. We so seldom saw him. I couldn't say it wasn't him. Poirot picked up a pin from the carpet and frowned at it severely. Then he continued, Would it be possible for the man to have entered the train at Bristol before you reached the carriage? Mason considered. Yes, sir, I think it would. My compartment was very crowded, and it was some minutes before I could get out, and then there was a very large crowd on the platform, and that delayed me too. But he'd only have had a minute or two to speak to the mistress that way. I took it for granted that he'd come along the corridor. That is more probable, certainly. He paused, still frowning. 
You know how the mistress was dressed, sir? Oh, the papers give a few details, but I would like you to confirm them. She was wearing a white fox fur toque, sir, with a white spotted veil and a blue frieze coat and skirt. The shade of blue they call electric. Hmm, rather striking. Yeah, remarked Mr. Halliday. Inspector Jap is in hopes that that may help us to fix the spot where the crime took place. Anyone who saw her would remember her. Précisément. Thank you, mademoiselle. The maid left the room. Well, Poirot got up briskly. That is all I can do here, except, monsieur, that I would ask you to tell me everything but everything. Why, I've done so. You are sure? Absolutely. Then there is nothing more to be said. I must decline the case. Why? Because you have not been frank with me. I assure you... No, you are keeping something back. There was a moment's pause, and then Halliday drew a paper from his pocket and handed it to my friend. I guess that's what you're after, Monsieur Poirot, though how you know about it fairly gets my goat. Poirot smiled and unfolded the paper. It was a letter written in thin, sloping handwriting. Poirot read it aloud. Cher Madame, it is with infinite pleasure that I look forward to the felicity of meeting you again. After your so amiable reply to my letter, I can hardly restrain my impatience. I have never forgotten those days in Paris. It is most cruel that you should be leaving London tomorrow. However, before very long, and perhaps sooner than you think, I shall have the joy of beholding once more the lady whose image has ever reigned supreme in my heart. Believe, cher madame, all the assurances of my most devoted and unaltered sentiments— Armand de la Rochefort. Poirot handed the letter back to Halliday with a bow. I fancy, monsieur, that you did not know that your daughter intended renewing her acquaintance with the Count de la Rochefort. <laughs> it came as a thunderbolt to me. I found this letter in my daughter's handbag. As you probably know, monsieur Poirot, this so-called Count is an adventurer of the worst type. Poirot nodded. But I want to know how you knew of the existence of this letter. My friend smiled. Monsieur, I did not. But to track footmarks and recognize cigarette ash is not sufficient for a detective. He must also be a good psychologist. I knew that you disliked and mistrusted your son-in-law. He benefits by your daughter's death. The maid's description of the mysterious man bears a sufficient resemblance to him. Yet you are not keen on his track. Why? Surely because your suspicions lie in another direction, therefore you were keeping something back. Yeah, you're right, Monsieur Poirot. I was sure of Rupert's guilt until I found this letter. It unsettled me horribly. Yes, the Count says, Before very long, and perhaps sooner than you think. Hmm. Obviously he would not want to wait until you should get wind of his reappearance. Was it he who travelled down from London by the 1214 and came along the corridor to your daughter's compartment? The Count de la Rochefort is also, if I remember rightly, tall and dark. The millionaire nodded. Well, monsieur, I will wish you good day. Scotland Yard has, I presume, a list of the jewels? Uh, yes. And I believe Inspector Jap of Scotland Yard is here now, if you would like to see him. Jap was an old friend of ours and greeted Poirot with a sort of affectionate contempt. And how are you, monsieur? No bad feeling between us, though we have got our different ways of looking at things. How are the little grey cells, eh? <laughs> Going strong? Poirot beamed upon him. They function, my good Jap. Assuredly they do. Well, then that's all right. I think it was the Honourable Rupert or the Crook. We're keeping an eye on all the regular places, of course. We shall know if the shiners are disposed of. And, of course, whoever did it isn't going to keep them to admire their sparkle. Not likely. I'm trying to find out where Rupert Carrington was yesterday. Seems a bit of a mystery about it. I've got a man watching him. Mm, a great precaution, but perhaps a day late, suggested Poirot gently. 
<laughs> you always will have your joke, Monsieur Poirot. Well, I'm off to Paddington, <coughs> Bristol, Western Taunton. That's my beat. So long. You will come round and see me this evening and tell me the result? Oh, sure thing, if I'm back. That good inspector believes in matter in motion, murmured Poirot as our friend departed. He travels, he measures footprints, he collects mud and cigarette ash. He is extremely busy. He is zealous beyond words, and if I mention psychology to him, do you know what he would do, my friend? He would smile. He would say to himself, Poor old Poirot, he ages, he grows senile. <laughs> Jap is the younger generation knocking at the door, and ma foi, they are so busy knocking that they do not notice that the door is open. Now what are you going to do? Well, as we have carte blanche, I shall expend three pence in ringing up the Ritz, where you may have noticed our count is staying. After that, as my feet are a little damp and I have sneezed twice, I shall return to my rooms and make myself a tisane over the spirit lamp. I did not see Poirot again until the following morning. I found him placidly finishing his breakfast. Well, I inquired eagerly, what's happened? Nothing. But Jap? I have not seen him. The count? He left the Ritz the day before yesterday. Well, the day of the murder? Yes. Well, then that settles it. Rupert Carrington is cleared. Well, because the Count de la Rochefort has left the Ritz? No, no. You go too fast, my friend. Well, anyway, he must be followed, arrested. But what could be his motive? One hundred thousand dollars worth of jewellery is a very good motive for anyone. No. The question to my mind is why kill her? Why not simply steal the jewels? She would not prosecute? Well, why not? Because she is a woman, mon ami. She once loved this man. Therefore she would suffer her loss in silence. And the Count, who is an extremely good psychologist where women are concerned, hence his successes, would know that perfectly well. On the other hand, if Rupert Carrington killed her, why take the jewels which would incriminate him fatally? Well, as a blind. Well, perhaps you are right, my friend. Ah, here is Jap. I recognize his knock. The inspector was beaming good-humouredly. "'Morning, Poirot. Only just got back. I've done some good work. <laughs> and you?' "'Me? I have arranged my ideas,' replied Poirot placidly. Jap laughed heartily. <laughs> "'Old chap's getting on in years,' he observed beneath his breath to me. "'That won't do for us young folk,' he said aloud. "'Quel dommage?' Poirot inquired. Well, do you want to hear what I've done? You permit me to make a guess? You have found the knife with which the crime was committed, by the side of the line between Weston and Taunton, and you have interviewed the paper boy who spoke to Mrs. Carrington at Weston. Jap's jaw fell. How on earth did you know? Don't tell me it was those almighty little grey cells of yours. I am glad you admit for once that they are almighty. <clears throat> Tell me, did she give the paper boy a shilling for himself? No, it was half a crown. Jap had recovered his temper and grinned. Pretty extravagant, these rich Americans. And in consequence, the boy did not forget her? No, not he. Half crowns don't come his way every day. She hailed him and bought two magazines. One had a picture of a girl in blue on the cover. Huh, that'll match me, she said. Oh, he remembered her perfectly. Well, that was enough for me. By the doctor's evidence, the crime must have been committed before Taunton. I guess they'd throw the knife away at once, and I walked down the line looking for it, and sure enough, there it was. I made inquiries at Taunton about our man, but of course it's a big station. It wasn't likely they'd notice him. He probably got back to London by a later train. Poirot nodded. Mm, very likely. But I found another bit of news when I got back. They're passing the jewels, all right. That large emerald was pawned last night by one of the regular lot. Who do you think it was? I don't know, except that he was a short man. Jap stared. Well, yeah, you're right there. He's short enough. It was Red Narky. Well, who is Red Narky? I asked. Well, a particular sharp jewel thief, sir, and not one to stick at murder. Usually works with a woman, Gracie Kidd. But she doesn't seem to be in it this time, unless she's got off to Holland with the rest of the swag. What, well, you've arrested Narky? 
Yeah, sure thing. But mind you, it's the other man we want, the man who went down with Mrs. Carrington in the train. He's the one who planned the job right enough, but Narky won't squeal on a pal. I noticed that Poirot's eyes had become very green. I think, he said gently, that I can find Narky's pal for you, all right? <laughs> one of your little ideas, eh? Jap eyed Poirot sharply. Wonderful how you managed to deliver the goods sometimes at your age and all. Devil's own luck, of course. Perhaps, perhaps, murmured my friend. Hastings, my hat. And the brush? So, uh, my goloshes, if it still rains. We must not undo the good work of that tisan. Au revoir, Jap. Oh, well, good luck to you, Poirot. Poirot hailed the first taxi we met and directed the driver to Park Lane. When we drew up before Halliday's house, he skipped out nimbly, paid the driver and rang the bell. To the footman who opened the door, he made a request in a low voice, and we were immediately taken upstairs. We went up to the top of the house and were shown into a small, neat bedroom. Poirot's eyes roved around the room and fastened themselves on a small black trunk. He knelt in front of it, scrutinized the labels on it, and took a small twist of wire from his pocket. Ask Mr. Halliday if you will be so kind as to mount to me here, he said over his shoulder to the footman. The man departed and Poirot gently coaxed the lock of the trunk with a practised hand. In a few minutes the lock gave and he raised the lid of the trunk. Swiftly he began rummaging among the clothes it contained, flinging them out on the floor. There was a heavy step on the stairs and Halliday entered the room. What in the hell are you doing here? he demanded, staring. I was looking, monsieur, for this. Poirot withdrew from the trunk a coat and skirt of bright blue frieze and a small toque of white fox fur. What are you doing with my trunk? I turned to see that the maid, Jane Mason, had entered the room. If you will just shut the door, Hastings. Thank you. Uh, yes, and stand with your back against it. Now, Mr. Halliday, let me introduce you to Gracie Kidd. Otherwise, Jane Mason, who will shortly rejoin her accomplice, Red Naki, under the kind escort of Inspector Jap. Poirot waved a deprecating hand. It was of the most simple. He helped himself to more caviar. It was the maid's insistence on the clothes that her mistress was wearing that first struck me. Why was she so anxious that our attention should be directed to them? I reflected that we had only the maid's word for the mysterious man in the carriage at Bristol. As far as the doctor's evidence went, Mrs. Carrington might easily have been murdered before reaching Bristol. But if so, then the maid must be an accomplice. And if she were an accomplice, she would not wish this point to rest on her evidence alone. The clothes Mrs. Carrington were wearing were of a striking nature. A maid usually has a good deal of choice as to what her mistress shall wear. Now, if after Bristol anyone saw a lady in a bright blue coat and skirt and a fur toque, he would be quite ready to swear he had seen Mrs. Carrington. I began to reconstruct. The maid would provide herself with duplicate clothes. She and her accomplice chloroform and stab Mrs. Carrington between London and Bristol, probably taking advantage of a tunnel. Her body is rolled under the seat and the maid takes her place. At Western, she must make herself noticed. How? In all probability, a newspaper boy will be selected. She will ensure he's remembering her by giving him a large tip. She also draw his attention to the color of her dress by a remark about one of the magazines. After leaving Western, she throws the knife out of the window to mark the place where the crime presumably occurred and changes her clothes or buttons a long Macintosh over them. At Taunton, she leaves the train and returns to Bristol as soon as possible, where her accomplice has duly left the luggage in the cloakroom. He hands over the ticket, and himself returns to London. She waits on the platform, carrying out her role, goes to a hotel for the night, and returns to town in the morning exactly as she said. When Jap returned from this expedition, he confirmed all my deductions. He also told me that a well-known crook was passing the jewels. I knew that whoever it was would be the exact opposite of the man Jane Mason described. When I heard that it was Red Naki, 
who always worked with Gracie Kid, well, I knew just where to find her. And the Count? The more I thought of it, the more I was convinced that he had nothing to do with it. That gentleman is much too careful of his own skin to risk murder. It would be out of keeping with his character. Well, Monsieur Poirot, said Halliday, I owe you a big debt. And the check I write after lunch won't go near to settling it. Poirot smiled modestly and murmured to me, The good chap, he shall get the official credit all right, but though he has got his gracie kid, I think that I, as the Americans say, have got his goat. Production Copyright 2003 All Rights Reserved as part of our Mystery Masters imprint, the Audio Partners Publishing Corporation is also pleased to be the publisher of many other Hercule Poirot mysteries, including Poirot Investigates, The Labors of Hercules, The Big Four, and Murder on the Orient Express. For a free audio editions catalog offering thousands of audiobooks on cassette and compact disc from all major publishers, call toll-free. 1-800-231-4261. Visit our website at www.audioeditions.com. If you enjoyed this audio and the value and effort that we bring you these audiobooks of world-class authors like Agatha Christie, then why not buy us a cup of coffee? Look for the link below in the description area. Make sure you subscribe to this channel so that you will not miss another audio. Thank you for supporting this channel. It is appreciated.